So I'm going to read The Prodigy, which is a short story that I published in Queer Words. And so this is The Prodigy by Robert Adams. Dream Diary, page one, Monday evening, 6th of November, 1995. As the taxi career round the bend, I, who wasn't really me, lurched towards the door. The taxi sped out of control and I, who looked like me, reached from behind, straining for control of the steering wheel. Simon took this as a positive sign. Tuesday morning, 31st of October 1995, first post. Presuming its contents, Simon snatched the envelope and rushed back to the room all aflutter. As he closed the door, even in a state of nervous excitement, or perhaps because of it, he made certain that the door had been properly snibbed. Safely in the confines of his own space, he held the envelope up for full inspection. No markings, that's true, yet it seemed all too obvious what Simon now perused. The replies seemed to glow, neon-like, from within. As he perched on the edge of his bed, Simon felt as though he had been an awfully long time since he'd placed the ad. New to London and feeling he'd been sorry, new to London and feeling he'd made a great escape, it seemed quite the natural step. Nothing to it really. Four pounds for twenty words. Twenty pence a word. Saying anything about any someone would normally cost a lot more than that, he mused. That was six weeks ago. Every morning since had been up at first post. Tottering on the edge, Simon suddenly wondered if the postman knew what the unmarked envelopes contained. He must have posted these things every day and probably laughs every time yet another unmarked brown envelope is slid through some letterbox. Simon's mind was all a whirl. Perhaps he keeps a note of all the places he delivers his dubious envelopes too. And how often? Simon concludes that the postman would be sure to return, demanding some form of payment. In kind? Gleaming menacingly into Simon's terrified gaze, he'd be forced to surrender to the overweight, leering and greasy postman. How would he sneak him into his room without his flatmate's knowledge? He could no longer bear the vividness of his vision. He shivered to see himself bent over for the pleasant and pleasure of this disgusting man, his weight coming down upon Simon and him, such a slim lad. Simon had never actually seen the postman, but in all probability he knew this would be the dreadful outcome. He shook the envelope in order to gauge how many prize he'd received. Two or three, he thought, or perhaps as many as four or five. He couldn't be sure. He laid the envelope on his lap and tried flattening it out in the hope of revealing the number of its contents through its contours. At least two, he knew that much. It was a puzzle. There seemed nothing else for it but to peel the envelope open and reveal its innards. Three smaller envelopes, which he laid in the bed, he stuck his head, his, sorry, he stuck his hand into the brown envelope just once, just in case. The last thing he wanted was to miss one, nothing. Satisfied, he turns his attention to the cause of his mounting excitement, the smaller envelopes. These he lifted and shuffled, one, two, three, and again, one, two, three, no more, no less. One long rectangular envelope, also brown in colour, one middle-sized white envelope, and one small square envelope, a tainted yellowish colour. He spread the letters flat in the bed and searched their surface for signs. The long rectangular envelope looked like an official envelope from a professional then. The white envelope was almost see-through, very thin and cheap. Simon thought this may, must be from some skinflint, the type of man who lives in a large, sprawling Victorian, gone to neglect through his penny-pinching ways. The small square envelope he liked, 
although there was something not quite right about that yellow colour. This had to be from a pleasant gentleman, probably a slightly feminine, self-made man, Simon reasoned. The problem then was how to open them. In which order? Simon, or should, sorry, should he open the small one first and work his way to the larger? Or the other way round? At length, he decided upon the first option. He led them, one on top of the other, the long brown, brown one at the bottom, then the middle sized envelope, and finally the small square one on top. The fold of the small envelope flipped open easily enough. He removed two pages, folded neatly in half, in the same tainted yellowish paper as the envelope itself. The first page, he quickly realised, had been typed and signed at the bottom. John. The second page, also typed, seemed to be one long run of phone numbers and times. He thought it best to read the letter first before attempting to cipher the second page. As he looked over the letter, he knew it to be an original, mistakes and all. Isn't that sweet, he smiled. The top of the page had the address of the sender, and then a few spaces below the letter read, Dear Box B203L. Sorry for starting the letter Dear Box, but I don't know your name yet. I read your ad and thought you sound very nice and straightforward. I think I can help you and we can get on. I'm 46 and unmarried and work different times. The next page gives the best times and numbers to phone me. I live with my mother and my brother lives near. I'm not a rich man, but I do think I can help you. If you like sound of me, phone. Best time is 5.50pm. If I do not hear from you, I hope you do well in your studies. Yours, John. Simon read the letter once more before attempting the second page. 5.50pm. He searched the list and could coming across the number which corresponded. The third number down. He underlined it and up marked it with a cross. He reread the letter once more picking out the important points. The man, Simon thought, was obviously very polite, apologising for beginning the letter in such a cold manner. That's good. Although, 46, that's quite old, isn't it? But then, if the man's dignified, refined and pleasant, he couldn't possibly look 46. Simon assured himself this would be the case. He states he's not a rich man, Another good point, it's a well known fact, people with money and class never flaunt the wealth. With spelling errors and things within the letter, Simon put these down to John's lack of expertise on the typewriter. Usually you'd have a secretary to do that sort of thing, I'm sure. But as this is a more personal and private letter, he'd no doubt wanted to do it himself. Simon folded a letter and neatly placed it back in the envelope. He now considered the middle envelope, the white one. On the top left hand corner, he could see the box number in large, heavy handwriting. Bold and confident, he thought. Now that would be good, he mused. A successful businessman or politician, after all. The envelope had probably been picked up in some corner shop for his safety reasons. Simon could almost see the man, smart, intense and rich. He'd be swept off his feet. The man would pay for all his college fees, all his costs and everything. He even momentarily contemplated giving up his studies altogether. The man would give Simon a job, a good job in his business, part-time of course, so he could still carry on painting. The studio would be attached to the country abode, like an outhouse, a private place all of his own. 